Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Machine Learning and Risk Engines for Security Data Analysis, How to Identify What's Real Versus What's Bogus, sponsored by ThreatX. My name is Carol Ott of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Dave Shackelford, SANS analyst, instructor, and course author, and Jeremiah Cruitt, CISO at ThreatX. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Jeremiah. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, Wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Crude. I'm the CISO for ThreadX. I've been working in the security space since I was a little kid. Uh, basically, if you've seen the movie War Games, that was very similar to my childhood, except no machine ever asked me if I wanted to play a game. Uh, so I've been doing this in various forms, and uh, security is pretty much uh, my life and what I enjoy and what I do in my free time as well. You want to introduce yourself, Dave? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love this. I love this picture. This is like my pro wrestling picture, actually, where it looks like I'm ready to like jump on somebody. But uh, I, I'm the same guy, right? I'm, I'm the same security guy. I've been doing it forever. I can't even imagine, uh, you know, doing anything else. And, and you know, so I've been in the space for about 20 years and have no plans to slow down. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah, it's a fun, fun space to be in. It's always changing and always something new to learn. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to ask a poll question here. There we go. So the question is, how often do you analyze data from your web application firewall? Uh, if you can uh, answer a poll question, we'll uh, um, get that answered and then move on. I'd like to know this. Believe it or not, yeah, it's an answer uh, that, that that I'm a little intrigued by because this is one of those places that I, I you know I I think I think people have there's a lot of WAFs out there and I don't know that everybody's really maximizing the benefits of those WAFs and what they're really doing with them. So let's find yeah, out. I think what, what we, we see we we see that's good. At least somebody's looking at it here. Looks like, um, but it is a problem with a lot of security tools and WAF especially. Is a lot of people have them turned on or in monitoring mode, but really aren't looking at the data from day to day. And that's something I see across the board. And as we've seen a lot of different breaches uh, and aftermath of them, you know, a lot of times their tools are telling them that there was a problem, but no one was actually, you know, monitoring and watching for the results. So uh, definitely a good question. It look, looks like uh, daily and weekly. So we've got a good amount of people who are doing that regularly. And then uh, some people doing it monthly, and I, we didn't ask the question of uh, never, but I assume there's probably a few uh, nevers <laughs> out there as well. Just not going to answer. Yeah, you know what? We're just not even getting into that right now. But, I mean, this is, hey, that's encouraging, actually. You know? So, yeah, that is. I mean, a th r roughly a third on e on each one of them. I, I'm a little surprised. I, I, I would have thought a higher percentage on monthly, and, I, I mean, I don't want to say significantly lower, but, yeah probably a fair amount lower on daily and weekly just just due to the nature of how hectic operations are these days yeah the really the question is uh, on the daily uh, is that people who are just putting it into their web uh, into their sim um, and so they're feeding the results into a sim and they count uh, basically having all the data there and uh, looking at it in aggregate uh, with others is that uh, considered daily monitoring too so I, I've met a lot of companies where it's, if it's in the sim, it's being monitored, and uh, that's the story they tell the auditors, and uh, it's all good. So. <laughs> yep, check the box, move on. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, let me move on to the next slide. So, yeah, a lot of data being created, obviously, um, all the time, and uh, oh, it's not moving on for me. There we go. Yeah. And, yeah so and how I, do we deal I with all this? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I think I think the theme of this discussion that we're going to have today, and 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 I love having it by the way, because I think it, it it's healthy to not only to, sort of take a step back and analyze what's going on in the industry and the direction that things are moving. Certainly, a lot of the buzzwords that are out there, but I think it's realistic to say, hey, you know, is, is this something that's real and is it something that's needed? 
when we start talking about machine learning and AI and, you know, analytics and the whole gamut of that, me personally, if you had asked me that two years ago, I would have, I would have made some sort of off the cuff, you know, Terminator joke or, or whatever and just said, ah, you know, whatever. But today, the, the reality is setting in. I, you know, you, you take the WAF as just one element of what's going on. I mean, it, we have controls all over the place, right? So we have all these different things that are happening. And, and uh, coming from a security operations background myself, I do distinctly remember the days when we were asking people, you know, we were desperate for data. Like, ah, come on, help us, you know, help us out. <laughs> Get, we, we need logs. We need data. Now we've got more than we even possibly know what to do with. And a lot of the tools and, and techniques that we've relied on for so long are, are just starting to choke on this data. And, you know, it's not like we don't still need the intelligence that, that's being derived from it, but I, I think we do need something better. And so I, I don't see this as being purely buzzword mania. You know, I think it feels that way just because all of a sudden every vendor in the space is miraculously an artificial intelligence vendor. Um, but the, the, the fact is we need some of this. I, I don't know. D does that jive with you? Or are you seeing the same thing? You know, I see everyone saying they are, but really they aren't. Uh, you know, oftentimes when you go talk to these companies, technical people, they, they acknowledge that it's their marketing team forcing them to use the term AI. Um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of companies out there doing that. I, I mean, I love the concept. I, I definitely think we need a lot more intelligence in dealing with this massive volume of data. But, you know, at the end, you know, if statistics give you the data you want, call it statistics and just say, you know, we find what you're looking for in this method with this, this uh, way we do it. You don't necessarily have to say you're doing machine learning or AI unless you really are. And, and I've drilled a lot of vendors and they're really not doing it, you know, but they're doing good things. They're doing interesting work. It's just they're not actually doing true machine learning or true AI. I think that's exactly right. And, and, and I think that's, that's probably the theme that I keep coming back to, which is, you know, let's, let's get to the real brass tacks of what machine learning and what real AI are, and then let's talk about whether you're really actually doing that. <laughs> and, and so actually, I think that's probably a pretty good segue to roll into the next slide so that we can maybe sort of flesh that out a little bit and, and say, you know, what, what does that actually mean? Because I, I find a lot of people bandying these terms around and not inherently knowing behind the scenes, if you talk to people that really do this, what that constitutes. Um, and and to, to me, I like to try to bring it down to the brass tacks, sort of the simple things, and you know, uh, explain it that way because I think that that's helpful other than just this lofty pie in the sky concept. Machine learning conceptually, not difficult. Tactic, uh, tactically, you know, putting it in place is much more difficult. But what it means is you're training a machine to sort of solve a problem, and you're doing that through patterns and pattern indicators that are identifiable and able to be fed into algorithms that can improve over time. This is really a, a continuous improvement mechanism. And so machine learning, if you go back and, and sort of in, investigate how that's been evolved with not only computer science, but even in the fields of psychology and, and you know, sort of more traditional sciences, what we're doing is saying, hey, look, we've got some finite data set. And in this case, as you can see on the, uh, on the slide, you know, we're saying, hey, look, there are pictures being fed into some algorithms of horses. Well, what are the attributes that define a horse? And so you look for perhaps, uh, you know, a certain length of, of, you know, sort of the facial structure. You look for hooves. You look for, uh, you know, maybe a body structure. You look for a tail. You look for certain ear patterns. You know, you look for these things, the, the, the way the, the nose comes down. You know, you look for these things and, and basically say, can we identify this with these 17, you know, finite indicators as a horse and say yes or no? And so you feed yeah, a thousand a of, pictures or a million pictures. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges with that, obviously, because, you know, a lot of horses have different patterns on them. You know, if you're going to find something with hooves, you might find a cow. You know, there's a lot of challenges to do that. Exactly. Very similar to, you know, challenges we're facing in, in security industry. But really, you know, you look at these pictures here and, while some of them look very much, obviously, they can be easily identified, you know, a horse with its head down looks fairly different than one that's from the side. So there's a lot of data you need to really make a good determination of, is this a horse or not? Agreed. Agreed. And trying to automate that with machines 
compounds that difficulty exponentially, right? Because you and I obviously have some real world, you know, sort of context to bring to this. We can look at this and go, oh yeah, you know, I could identify a horse from the back, from the front, from the side. You know, I, I understand horse as a con as a concept, but a machine doesn't. <laughs> you have to tell it this is what makes a horse a horse. And so you, you're exactly right. Like, what are the patterns? What are the indicators that would do that with a reasonable degree of success? And then you try to improve upon that. And, and I think that's, you, you know, exactly where we're going to go. You, you know, again, we're not here to talk about horses. We're here to talk about machines <laughs> and what they can learn and what they can do and how we can, of course, apply that to the security industry. So I think you're taking us in exactly the right direction. It's, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy problem for sure. We could probably roll right. on. And I think we roll on. But one thing I'll add on to the horse, just to be the, the horse on the ground there, um, is, you know, it, there's also the question of how horsey does this look? So that, that algorithm is going to have to get spit out a, you know, what level uh, do I believe this looks like a horse? You know, does it have enough horse attributes that make it enough of a horse? And I'm going to give it a 90% rating or an 80% rating. So, you know, what level do I believe in confidence that this truly is a horse from that machine learning? So, you know, that confidence, no, I think, is, is important as it goes on. Yeah, identify horse. Yeah, yeah, like degree of horsiness. <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, what, what's the confidence level, in other words, based on whatever you've told it? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this rolls into machine learning for security uh, quite well because, I mean, we're looking for that badness, right? How how much of a level of badness is this thing we're looking for? So, you know, that machine learning concept really plays well and kind of really helps us get to that level. Um, and we have the same issues, you know, as these machines trying to figure out what the horse looks like is, you know, different types of data patterns for security can be completely different depending on, you know, what exactly you're looking at, whether you're looking at uh, uh, data on, uh, types of attacks, uh, looking at malware, looking at uh, web application attacks, looking at, you know, general security data from you're getting fed into your SIM from all these different systems. There's a lot of different kinds of data. And that's why I think machine learning can really, you know, step in and start being more useful. And I think that's true. And, and, and I mean, I think it's not even hard to come up with examples of why it's hard and why it's also incredibly important, right? So, so take, you know, how, how many of us for all the years we've been in this industry have said, you know, look, antivirus software, all the conspiracies about the antivirus, you know, software industry being, you know, secretly in cahoots creating malware. I, I don't think that's necessarily realistic, but how many times have we seen specific behavioral patterns of the antivirus software itself acting like something suspicious or malicious at the endpoint? You know, it, depending on what quantifiable variables you included here, you could say, ah, this, you know, this executable is acting up, but it's actually your antivirus. It's not the, it's not the, you know, malware itself. It's the endpoint agent that's doing things at a very low level of the operating system, ostensibly to protect you, but it might be flagged as something malicious. Same thing for web apps, right? H how do you differentiate between a reconnaissance effort on the part of a, mal uh, of a malicious actor versus a really confused end user that is just clicking around randomly and has absolutely no idea what they're doing. So it, it, it is hard. It's hard to come up with those yeah. use cases to be able to say, hey, this is always good or always bad. Right. And we see this too. It's interesting that you bring that up because we have a methodology for looking for good bots versus bad bots. You know, the Google bots, the Yahoo bots uh, versus, you know, a bot trying to scan your site to look for bad things. And, we've had a lot of issues because people have been uh, making the good bots do bad things. So uh, there's a, a few articles out there and we have one on a Yahoo one, but uh, how Google, uh, the people are putting up uh, sites to basically have Google go through and attack other sites by calling a site with SQL injection embedded in link. So uh, we've seen this as well. And we, and we have methods to look for these good bots and bad bots, but then we still have these other types of attacks. So, uh, it is it does become extremely difficult to figure out, you know, what should you call good and what should you call bad, and is that always the case? Because we've we've also seen, you know, security tools actually get taken over and used for bad things. So it's uh, it, it's kind of hard if you just always call a certain set of things good by a whitelisting uh, approach, 
um, you know, you can get in trouble with that as well. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, we've seen this movie before. In fact, it takes me yeah. all the way back to, I mean, gosh, this is probably showing my age, but this has got to be back to like the early 2000s where people were spinning up these little sample PHP scripts that would allow you to do like pings, you know, like, uh, you know, you could go to a site and it would allow you to do a ping of another site or like a very simple, uh, you know, sort of packet scan of, of an IP address. And it was like a sample script that people were setting up, but you could go look for this on Google. You know, you could create a simple Google query and find these people that had probably very innocently, you know, spun these little simple, you know, sort of network check scripts up. And then you could go do all the recon you wanted from somebody else's site, right? And it would never come back to you and be traceable. And, and that whole concept is just manifesting in far more advanced and, you know, obviously serious ways today. And that's exactly it. You know, how do you, how do you peg that? It's very, very difficult. Yeah, exactly. And now we have Shodan to do it all for us and find all those bad uh, <laughs> systems uh, set up without much effort. Yep, yeah. yep, exactly. The yeah. Recent Shodan, Shodan, Shodan. Yeah. yeah, the best of the worst, right? Yeah, exactly. I do love it, though. I can spend hours on Shodan. It's kind of uh, dangerous. No, it is. And it's actually, you know, it's funny. I always talk about this with my students in, in classes. And I'm like, look, this is the search engine you really don't ever want to show up on. You know, it's, <laughs> it's it's that search engine, right? But it is what it is. It, um, yep. And, and you know, but, but, but the, you know, actually, you bring up a really good point. And I think it helps sort of clarify the issue at hand, which is why we're talking about machine learning and, and sort of rapid fire analytics capabilities that, that, need to, that need to happen. It's getting harder to differentiate. You have tools that are out there that can be used for good or bad. You have, you know, so many things going on that you actually have to start looking deeper to identify intent or patterns of behavior that could indicate intent versus just, oh, this is a bot from, you know, from Yahoo. Like you said, we trust Yahoo explicitly. Anything coming from Yahoo has to be good because it's coming from Yahoo. Well, that's actually not true. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to start looking, I think, a little further than that. Yeah, and I think that's why you need to look at multiple factors. So even with machine learning, you know, it can identify something as, you know, malicious or bad, but, you know, maybe it is, you know, not actually uh, that bad. Maybe it's actually doing a normal thing. I, I've seen this with uh, search engine optimization tools that marketing teams uh, sign up with. And I keep picking on the marketing team, so I'm going to apologize to all of them out there. But um, signing up for a search engine, a, a engine optimization tool, which basically crawls your site, which is good behavior, but um, you may just see that one indicator for your machine learning and say, hey, this is, this is bad traffic, this is bad behavior, um, but it's actually authorized and good. So I think taking multiple uh, multiple data points and adding up uh, really helps you there, not trusting one single solution or tool. Agreed. All right, should we keep moving on here? Let me see. Uh, here we have Let's uh, do it. awesome uh, diagrams. Well, you know, none of these presentations are really – going to satisfy anybody unless we've got some flow chart diagram sort of situation, you know, so here we are. Boxes right? and I, arrows. I think that's, no, I, of course. I mean, you got to have, well, and multicolored boxes with several arrows. That's, that's key to the there whole thing, go. right? So definitely key. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, all, all kidding aside, this just piggybacks on exactly what we were saying a minute ago, which is like, you can feed a bunch of data into some code and it'll do something right. So it's a function. It, you know, it's got input, output, we all know that, but the concept of machine learning is that there's a feedback loop. So you say, hey, yep. look, here's data. We feed it to something that we think is going to handle it in this way, and that's the whole hypothesis component of this. And what we do is we say, were we successful in our hypothesis? So we think all these attributes of a horse that we've defined are going to have a successful outcome in terms of the, you know, algorithm identifying a horse picture versus a non-horse picture. Were we correct? Yes or no? Right. I, I think that's at the, at the basic premise, what we're sort of after here. Yeah. And, and this is a great thing to like ask your vendors too. I mean, when they say, you know, we've looking at behavior analysis and we're going to find the people that are behaving different than other people or the, the systems that are operating differently. When you start looking at that and they just say, well, it's different or it's more or it's less. I mean, those are all basically statistical terms. So really this is machine learning is where you have that feedback coming back in there. And so, if they're not learning from what's uh, good for your environment or bad for your environment, if, they're not, if there isn't a method to teach it or have it automatically learn, um, then it's not really machine learning. It may still be extremely useful and good, but it's not 
necessary in machine learning and very far away from yeah, AI. No, 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 yeah, I mean, exactly, because that, that is the key, is the machines have to actually get better. <laughs> yep. yeah, you know, and, it, and, and if it's just a bunch of, you know, folks sitting in a room going, well, this looks interesting. Well, that's not machine learning. That's people that are still behind the scenes just managing all of it. So you've got to have that sort of automation element of, you know, feeding it into a bunch of systems that have algorithms applied to say, yes, no, did it work? If yes, keep, you know, continuing along. If no, you know, maybe make adjustments on the fly based on some parameters and things you've defined. So I, I think there's a lot here. And it's not a trivial right. area to just say, oh, yeah, you know, we've got it, you know, we've got it figured out. I don't think we do. Well, <laughs> I certainly don't yeah, think most often, security vendors have it figured out. <laughs> well, no one's got it figured out. I think the people that tell you they have it all figured out are the, the ones you have to be worried about. Um, but, you know, this feedback loop oftentimes is manual, right? So it's a person who has to come in here and identify, okay, it, we've got this result. Is it correct? Is it is it a false positive? Is it a false negative? Um, is it, uh, you know, could it have been uh, figured out quicker, better, faster? So adding that feedback in sometimes is, or oftentimes is a manual effort uh, because you do need that, you know, pattern recognition skills of a human to, to really figure out, yes, this is good or no, this is bad. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and you know, given that it's the humans that came up not only with the algorithms, but are providing the initial contextual background anyway, fair enough, right? You know, and in security, that's even more difficult because you're going into significantly more complex problems than are we looking at horse pictures or are we not? <laughs> yeah. So it gets even a little and more challenging there. Well, exactly. And sometimes it requires some pretty intense analysis to really figure out if something is bad. I mean, you know, there's still a place for, you know, incident response teams to go in there and say, okay, this thing we said was good, but it looked really weird. It did bad things. And going back and doing a full forensic analysis of, what did it actually do is almost sometimes required to really find out because uh, obviously the attackers are getting better and better at hiding their activities and make it look more like normal good behavior. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that, that feedback loop may take a while to get back to, but uh, uh, it, it's not always very easy to find. No, exactly. And and finding the right people that can be able to, you know, sort of differentiate those complex problems is, is sort of at the heart of it. And, and, oh, yeah. and I think this slide okay. illustrates that, right? That that th this brings a much more realistic use case for our industry to bear here in the discussion. Yeah, and this obviously is this is uh, you had kind of created this uh, this flow diagram, and and I looked at this, so this is kind of exactly what we do as a company. So same basic thing where we we saw um, you know how web application firewalls were being used in the past, and you know it, the real problem was that they were based on static signatures. You know, we're trying to figure out a way to do this in a better way. And one of the ways we're looking for is looking at, you know, behavior. So, you know, how do you do that? You find, you know, as many web application attacks as you possibly can, you know, and feed them into your machine learning algorithm and say, okay, here's what bad looks like. Here's all the, you know, components that make up bad. Um, and there's going to be, you know, the Venn diagram of those components that look like bad that also overlap with components that look like good. But, if you can kind of build up that initial, you know, um, database of what looks bad and what attacks look bad, then you can continually, you know, make it better over time, right? It's, you know, the whole point is it has to continuously evolve, right? Yeah, and I, and I think that's it because, yeah, bad today could be completely different a week from now. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and so you've got to, yeah, you've got to have that model where you can continually feed something that's, uh, hypothetically changing a number of parameters here, right? So, you know, what does a web uh, API attack look like? Well, what's an API, right? Are we talking about RESTful APIs? Are we talking about some other sort of APIs? Are we talking about, you know, things in specific header fields? Like, right, talk to me about what that even means. And the more of that you have, the more complicated this problem becomes. And certainly when you're talking about web firewalls and, and web-based attack scenarios, you know, you're you're upping the complexity, I think, pretty significantly. It's it, you know, th this isn't a, you know, in many cases at least, a simple sort of service-oriented compromise scenario. It's 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 going to be something that involves lots of parameters, lots of attack variables, lots of sort of, uh, you know, I, I would say fluid scenarios that requires a lot more detail. 
Yeah, definitely. And and I think you, your point about um, you know something that looked bad one week ago is and you know now doesn't look bad is we, we've seen that time and time again, and, and especially uh, recently with um, looking at uh, Jira's query language. Jira's query language looks like SQL injection attacks all day long. So, you know, when we trained on SQL injection attacks um, and then put our training up against a, a Jira site, um, it just started, you know, blocking everything and, and alerting on, uh, you know, all the attacks. So, you know, we had to retrain that to say, okay, um, if you see this as Jira and you see this, then it's not bad. But if you see it not as Jira, then it's still bad. So. Um, continuing going back and relooking at you know that data and saying is it still valid is is something you pretty much have to do continually to keep the model improving. Yeah, and I think that's the key. you just said it. it it's continuous improvement, right? So you got to keep progressing and you've got to keep feeding data and you have to keep feeding current and up to date data that's being seen in the wild because just like you know say threat intelligence or any other area, if you've got your idea of what's hey this attack scenario, but it's it, six months old, a year old, you're not really providing a lot of value there, right? You, you, you've got a machine learning model that's outdated already. Yeah, exactly. And and we kind of have seen that in the past with, uh, you know, kind of the old way antivirus is done with, you know, um, kind of old methods of looking at the heuristics of what's going on, you know, and they really didn't keep that updated and they didn't really kind of apply sort of a machine learning methodology to it. Uh, from what I could see, just because it was never very effective, um, you know, so it, that sort of, you know, continuously learning, continuously uh, evolving it is, I think, so important in our industry just because everything is always changing and things that are benign today are bad tomorrow and, and things that are, you know, bad today sometimes become benign uh, after a bit. So, yeah, it's really interesting. I think why uh, this sort of, you know, automatic learning methodology um, fits uh, security so well. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. You got to have something that's, that's a continuous process, right? Yep, definitely. I was going to point out here also, like, uh, again, uh, this is machines doing this analysis and they're coming out with a, you know, how how much does this look like a, a, an attack, right? So, you know, when it says very likely a, a web API attack, you know, that's a level of confidence score, right? And Maybe uh, if you're, you know, at a certain level of confidence, you're just going to call it bad and block it. Um, but maybe at a, you know, lesser level, you're going to say, okay, no, this has to be re-looked at, right? So flag for follow-up and say, okay, some some other system, process, or person then needs to look at this and validate, is it really an attack or is it not, right? So that, that sort of, you know, um, you know, confidence level, again, to me is extremely important um, you know, just to be able to really say, okay, how confident am I that this is actually an attack? Yeah, yeah, and and you know that, that's probably where people have to come in again. <laughs> you know, like, look, we we we've seen these attacks. We can we can do the validation. You know, so much, especially on newer things, where it's like, look, you're trying to train a system. You may have some really finite, you know, almost like hair trigger changes or things that they really do require some human involvement, at least at a point before you can get the machine learning algorithms on that track of saying, okay, you know, we've got these things fairly well identified, but you know, it, developing this is, is, is a labor of love, you know, from everybody I've ever oh, yeah. seen that has a true machine learning algorithm or set of algorithms it, it you know, it requires significant data science expertise. It, you know, this isn't a trivial thing that anybody can just spin up and, and, you know, Hey, look, we've got a, you know, an elk stack and we know what we're doing. It, it just doesn't work that way. You know, going back to our previous point, outstacks have been uh, starting to, suddenly uh, a big issue in compromises with Shodan showing all the open exposed uh, ELK uh, data sets out there. So um, if you do have one out there, make sure it's not exposed to the Internet. Just a, just a little point there. <laughs> That's a good point. I do. I mean, I do love that whole elk stack. I, uh, it, it's great stuff. Um, but again, um, you know, that's that's a that's a point to start playing. Right. So if you can take that data and learn from that data and then continuously build upon it, you can do some great things. But, you know, a lot of people just say, well, we have all this data and we're going to do analysis on it and come up with, you know, what's good, bad, what's the top talker, what's the least, uh, you know, happening out there. And that's great. And that's fantastic. And that's statistics. Uh, which I'm a big fan of. I got a whole slide on statistics later on here. Um, but 
Um, it's not really machine learning, right? And again, it doesn't have to be. You know, there's a lot of value that, that comes out of it, but you know, again, machine learning has to have this this loop here to continually learn to make that that uh, methodology better. I'm going to move us on here. Yeah, I can. cruise on. Yeah, I know. I'm like, well, you're probably going to get it to the, to move faster than me. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be the thing we're talking right. about today. <laughs> Sweet. So we've got a couple uh, use cases here we're going to go through. And, and obviously, the one I care about most is uh, web application firewalls. Um, you know, it's a great example of where machine learning can help just because, again, we have massive quantities and varieties of attack sources. And that's that's again an always changing you know number right so always new types of attacks always new ways of using old attacks or hiding old ones um, you know it's a it's constantly evolving constantly changing um, you know sometimes it's just the nature of it and sometimes it's people who are tr you know specifically trying to you know uh, do something old better and and make it uh, um, you know, less easy for things to spot because they know that people are looking for that specific type of attack and that specific method. So, you know, lots of challenges. Um, and so what we do, you know, look for common attack characteristics. There's always going to be something somewhat similar amongst all of them, uh, especially in web applications because there's, you know, limited ways that they can be attacked. Um, you know, but you, you know, sit there and train on success and failure. And, and failure is important. Um, I'm a big fan of failure. Um, just because, you know, you learn the most from the, the fails, right? So um, if you're not looking for those failures and accepting and changing, um, you know, whether that's just reteaching uh, your algorithm to not see that or if it's going back and rewriting your algorithm to be better at detecting um, or not detecting with the false positive um, something, that's that's what has to happen. And so, um, you know, that's, that's something you have to continue to learn from. Um, but, you know, you continue doing this as uh, new things are released. So as, you know, we see new types of attacks, you have to continually train and, um, you know, make your system uh, learn from that. Uh, we had a great example of the, the newest stress vulnerability that came out. Um, you know, when we saw the attack type against that, we tried it against our, our system and it didn't detect it right away. It took a few tries before we detect it. And block it. Um, so we had to go in and retrain our algorithm and say, oh, "You should, you know, block this on the first try. This is a, you know, the new kind of stress attack, and you have to learn from that." And so that's just a relearning uh, methodology that you go through and do. Um, you know, that's uh, that's exactly how we operate, and then we create a risk score from each one of those. So uh, again, that scoring to me is extremely important because I don't want to trust any single one tool to be the right answer. Every different portion is going to give me a different, you know, confidence level of does this look bad? Does this look normal? And is this good? Or, you know, what do I need to do with all this data? No, I, I agree. Comments on that? You know, yeah. No, I mean, I, and you know, it's funny when I when I sort of think through this just as conceptually, and you know, we we've got plenty to do, so we'll cruise on here. But I, you know, I, I look back at you know Thomas Edison inventing the light bulb, and you know, he was quoted as being basically saying, look. You know, it took me a thousand plus tries to figure out the right material for the filament, but none of those were failures. They were just something that didn't work. And so, you know, it, yep. it, it, you do, it, it is a training exercise. And the faster and more efficiently you can do that, the more effective you're going to be at ultimately turning it into something that benefits or, or, you know, sort of improves the outcomes. So this is exactly the model you're looking for, especially with diverse use cases or scenarios like web app, firewall. You know, like what, like basically anything a web app firewall sees, it's going to be probably a little more diverse than a lot of the more traditional network-based scenarios, because just just due to the nature of the web and, and applications in general. Yeah, every application is different, and and how people use the data in their applications can can look for it pretty bad uh, depending on how they're doing it. So, um, you know, it's it's really the more applications you see, the more you see that there's just incredible differences between all of them. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I'll move on to the next one here. And this is uh, this is uh, uh, one of my favorite companies out there that uh, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but this is basically what their business model was, right? So you have you know all these types of malware out there, you know billions of them, <laughs> um, changing all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a, 
I love, I love, the, I love the last outcome. Yeah, no, I'm, just, I'm just laughing, right? I'm like, yeah, no, no names need to be said, actually, when, uh, you know, <laughs> put it in that context. But, but you know, look, uh, we, we can have some fun with this, right? The, the reality is you are looking at, I mean, malware is a perfect example of stuff that's changing dramatically all the time, right? I mean, it's, it's another one where the, the attackers are way smarter. They're better coders. They know that they've got to repackage things so that they're avoiding the, the static signature models and things. And it's, you know, if you're really trying to build a true machine learning model around malware variants, you better put some serious effort into that, right? I mean, the, the reality is that that is a very difficult space. You know, even just defining what constitutes malware is, is more and more difficult these days. You know, what is malware? We, we, could, we could have a conversation for an hour on just that. Yeah. Yep. And, and <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I mean, all of that, you know, a question of how to learn and how to train on it. I mean, you know, it's, um, it, it's a, there's a large data set to train from. So I'm not certain why, you know, antivirus vendors hadn't done this in the past, but, you know, really just, you know, applying machine learning, this was really uh, fantastic. And they call it AI, by the way. So, um, I, I I could give him some hard time well, on that, course. but <laughs> that's true. But yeah, we, look, look, let's call it machine learning for our gratification here, right? But uh, there you, you go. Know, at, the, at the end of the day, you're, you're you're exactly right. I mean, we certainly have a lot of data. We have a lot of historical data. We have a lot of trends. We have a lot of patterns. You know, we've got both static and behavioral indicators that we could feed in. I think it's more a matter of the algorithms and that continuous evolution scale that 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 makes it perhaps challenging for for vendors to put that into practice and then, you know, ultimately turn it into something that manifests in the form of better detection and prevention at the endpoint. You know, it's got to actually turn into something too. It can't just be, ah, this looks interesting. You know, it's got to do something, <laughs> I, yep. you know, hopefully with well, a, with a low degree of false positives. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I used to do pen testing and, and I can definitely say that it wasn't challenging or hard to get around antivirus, right? You know, repacking your, your malware um, was easy, quick, and uh, built into a lot of the tools I used, right? So it wasn't even a challenging or difficult thing to do. And as soon as I repacked it, um, you know, if I uploaded the virus total, uh, we'd, we'd see, you know, one or two hits on, on heuristics, but, you know, the majority of them out there would not see that as malware anymore, right? So um, the, the techniques before these, these guys came along, really, are, are some of the other people doing behavioral analysis of, of attack types, um, you know, before those companies, really the traditional antivirus vendors were able to be bypassed extremely quickly and extremely easily, you know, and so, um, you know, these guys came along and, and uh, really, you know, saw an opportunity to help uh, do a better job at protecting from, you know, malware, and uh, they've done a fairly good job. I, I've used them before in a previous company and uh, very low false positives and, and very good at actually blocking things. And I think that comes from that machine learning capability, really. Well, I, I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, it, it, at some point, you've got to evolve. And if you're still out there slinging, uh, you know, static signatures without some sort of evolution behind the scenes, you know, you're going to be a dinosaur before too long. Yeah, and I do like how the traditional AV vendors have really, you know, upped their game. I'm I'm still a little sore at them for not doing it sooner. Um, but, you know, when you get the upstart challengers that, you know, are really, you know, figured out how to do it better and faster and quicker, you know, you have to evolve and change. And so um, I've seen a lot of them start getting that direction. Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of improvement in the overall space, but uh, there's still definitely companies that uh, need to step up. I'm still a little, Maybe little nervous get... about them getting bought by BlackBerry, though. So we'll see how that goes. Well, yeah, you know, believe it or not, I, BlackBerry is yeah, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> we'll save that one. It is for 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 I... another time. But but it yeah yeah they're still a huge technology company. We'll we'll see what happens. Exactly, and and I was an original BlackBerry BlackBerry true believer. So it was a it was a very difficult day when they took my BlackBerry away and and handed me an iPhone. So. You know, I I, uh, I kind of miss them quite a bit, but you know, at the same time, things keep evolving and changing. You got to keep up. Exactly, this is true. All right, let's see if I can move on here. So I, again, I, I keep I keep harping on this, and and I, I've definitely made vendors come in who came in and told me they did AI or malware, 
you know, cry a little bit as I pounded them into submission and, and got them to admit that what they were doing was statistics. But at the end of the day, is it useful? Is it providing the benefit that you want, right? And so, you know, some of the basics of statistics is, you know, looking for the thing that's doing the most or, you know, what is the, the entity out there that is doing something, you know, one or two or three standard deviations different than everybody else, right? So you're looking for those outliers, the different, you know, the patterns that you can find and stuff. It's all statistics and there's some really cool, exciting stuff like K-means clustering that you can do some pretty advanced analysis and, and a lot of people see, you know, that K-means clustering as machine learning or advanced and it's really just, you know, more advanced machine learning, right? or not machine learning, it's more advanced statistics. Um, and so it, it's great stuff. I'm, I'm really very happy with a lot of statistics, you know, and it's one metric that you can easily use in, in security. I and mean, there's some, uh, you know, incident response tools out there based on just, you know, analyzing all the data from all your different systems in a Windows environment and telling you, you know, what uh, applications are used the least. Right, so finding those that single application or the one that's only running on one system, it's really interesting to find that and say, okay, what is that? Is it good or bad? You know, or the one that's doing the most, right? So there's there's a lot of great things you can get out of statistics, and I, I don't want people to call it a bad word. Uh, I want them to really embrace it as you know, you don't have to do machine learning. It may help, but uh, if you do some really good serious statistics, you can get some pretty good value out of it as well. No, that's exactly right. And, and in fact, that, that's sort of driven, I think, the evolution of sort of the data scientists and people that are using legitimate analytics platforms and such, uh, you know, programming in the R, programming language, like things that require a deep, deep mathematical knowledge of the fluctuation of data and pattern recognition and other things. But at the heart of it, you're exactly right. It's, it's not, that's not really machine learning. That's an analytics modeling scenario where you're saying, hey, look, here's standard deviations. Here's the mean, you know, in this scenario. Here's what's expected or what, you know, sort of falls outside as an outlier. And what does that actually mean to us? And how can we feed it back into a better performing analytics model? That is just stats, right? It's, it's a lot of stats and it's probably, you know, far beyond what most security professionals, certainly the more operationally oriented security professionals are going to sit down at a console and do on a day-to-day -day basis. But nonetheless, that is at the heart of telling us what's normal, abnormal, you know, where it's been seen before. All, all that comes down to statistics. I agree it's not a bad word. Yeah. And this is probably the rise of that data scientist position, which now is practically impossible to fill. And, and that, you know, if you go looking out there, it's one of the top things out on all the job boards is people looking for data scientists. Is there, starting to see the true value in them, uh, which is, is something I really appreciate. Especially for security. There's, there's like seven of those yep. people. And they're all gamefully yeah. employed and very happy, you know, so good luck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, you know, security <laughs> data analyst. That's, that is a, that's a, a, rare, a rarity out there. That's a unicorn that you have to go find. Yep, totally agree. So here's another, another thing I, I like to talk about is risk engines. And risk engines have actually been used in a lot of different industries for a long time. Um, you know, some people call them decisioning engines and, and you know, other terms. But, you know, I, I used to work heavily in the anti-fraud space, uh, helping stop uh, bad money transfers around the world. And you know, a lot of what we use there is risk scores, right? So, you know, you take a lot of different um, inputs and, you know, each input has got a score um, and you have a confidence level for each of those inputs. Um, th the great thing about creating a risk engine is it's also easy to replace tools and things that don't work, right? So if you have something and you get less and less confident in it, at a certain point, you just remove that specific um, indicator and you try and find a replacement that gets a better confidence for, for you. So uh, risk engines are fantastic, um, I think, for taking all these different things. And so. You know, if you've got a machine learning uh, confidence and say this looks attackery um, of a, you know, 70% and then you have um, a separate item that says, you know, statistically this is behaving differently than, you know, all the other people coming in. Um, and then add a few other things. Uh, we look at, you know, intensity and we look at, you know, what sort of user agent they have. And, you know, so you add up all of these different components and make a risk uh, score uh, uh, decision, right? So you say, 
you know, at this certain level, we're going to block them. At this certain level, we're going to uh, analyze it further. And, you know, that allows you to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of power while keeping false positives down because you're not just looking at one single item to make that determination. Right? I don't, I don't believe completely in machine learning that it's going to be able to tell me that this is an attacker, you know, every single time. You know, I want to look at a lot of different factors to really make that decision of is this good or bad. Um, so there's a, a lot of different components that can go into this. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a great model to kind of build in. You can build it for a lot of different areas, um, you know, in security. So uh, whether you're looking at this uh, from a, you know, a auto security automation perspective where you're pulling a lot of different tools to say, you know, is the system been compromised and you're pulling from your EDR and from your antivirus and, you know, you're looking at, you know, any communication going out. And each of those tools is giving you a score to say, this is good or bad. Uh, it's just, I think, a great way to start looking at this uh, from a higher perspective and not just at a single tool, whether it's machine learning, statistics, or something else. Well, I, I think I think you brought up a really good sort of analogy there in the, in the form of fraud, right? Because I think fraud's an easily explainable use case here where you say, look, financial institutions have staggering quantities of data that they can uh, sort of slot into a model for saying this is a good or a bad transaction, right? This is a good or a bad phone call coming into a, you know, to, to a teller or, or, you know, somebody in a bank in, environment asking for account information. Like we, there, there's so many known elements that tie into this that you can, with a reasonable degree of comfort today, I'd say, you know, getting to, towards 2019, Say yeah, here is a score, you know, on a on a scale of zero to one, you know, with point nine being it's definitely bad, <laughs> and point one being eh, it might have been you know somebody calling from a different place than normal or you know whatever they're doing, but that's it. You know, we've got so much data to to feed into that. I think the the harder problems of other attack scenarios and threat situations. You know, you, we, I don't even know that we feel like we've got enough data to support that level of modeling and that, you know, sort of risk decisioning. Yeah, you, you, you know, think I think we need more data? <laughs> well, I, I think we need more data and more variation. You know, I think right. you look at something like, you think you look at something like malware, I know we've got so many different types, you know, hey, this is what, you know, this is what led to, you know, viruses, to worms, to bots. And, and we've got so much there. We've got billions of samples that could uh, be indicative of those things. You look at web-based attacks, I I'm gonna argue that the more sophisticated web-based attacks have really only been in the wild for the last 10 to 12 years. Really, I mean, uh, you know, like if you're talking about traditional SQL injection, yeah, we probably spot some of that classic stuff. But if you're talking about yep. some of the more sophisticated types of attacks, and especially manipulation of changing standards, you know, that's where I think the thing gets real interesting too, because it's like, well, okay, you know, now, I mean, I, I always put the term HTTP in quotes because it's the most manipulatable protocol on the planet. Um, you know, you can just oh, add good. arbitrary header values in that are totally accepted by services. So how do you how do you quantify that? How do you turn that into threat modeling with some degree of consistency? It's tough. Yeah, it is. And and really, you know, those really advanced attacks are customized per web application per site. Right. So. You know, they're really only attacking you specifically. So, you know, right. um, when I've done web app attack in the past, it's, you know, I'm sitting there trying to figure out what is best for your site. Like, what is the way to attack you? And a lot of times it's similar to others, but, you know, a lot of times you're trying to find that very specific thing. And, you know, the truly advanced hackers out there are, are you know, attacking your web technologies and everything else at the same time. So, you know, the types of attacks that are out there are, are you know, getting more complex and getting more interesting, really. So I, I have a lot of fun uh, looking through our, our logs and looking for some of the uh, attack type traffic and seeing, you know, exactly what are they trying to do and how are they doing it? Uh, just because it, it's interesting and, and it's really different for every single attack, uh, except for the bots, which do the same attack across everyone. But that, that's fairly easy. Well, exactly. But I'll tell you, I really think we need more data, which we should talk about. Because yep. <laughs> yep. I think that's really the key. I, I do actually think that's the key. Um, you know, well, I think we may have to have another talk it, on just that one. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's debatable. You know, there's probably some people hanging out with us today that are you know shaking their fist at us saying such a thing. But uh, me personally, I, I'm sort of yep. of the opinion that you know data and data diversity are the things that are going to help us figure this out. Yeah, and, and different systems uh, that give you better sort of high fidelity data on certain things. So you know, it, you talk about in the fraud space. Uh, there's there's one risk engine item that that basically looks for degrees of separation between you and whoever's doing the transaction with you. So if you're calling the call center, they're looking up your name and seeing if you're related or if you lived in the same apartment or if you, you know, they're looking at a lot of different data and pulling that out to say, you know, you specifically are related within two degrees of separation to the person doing the transaction with you and that's a high risk score, right? So um, some of those types of, of really complex and kind of, um, you know, very uh, large, large amounts of data set just to create that um, ability. You know, that's something that I think we're we're moving towards definitely in the security industry. I, I think we're moving towards it. <laughs> I, we're I, not I think, there I yet. Think, you know, no, not well. I think I think we're getting there. Actually, I'm pretty bullish on some of the well, things I'm seeing like, people develop. Yeah, oh, there's a lot of cool new technologies out there. I'm I'm constantly impressed by new ways and new new companies out there thinking about you know some of the old problems in new ways and, and really getting us some more interesting data to work with yeah well yeah and it's funny so I, so i've basically been in charge of the sans security analytics survey that we've done gosh for a lot of years so it started off as the log management survey it morphed into the analytics survey and, and you know it's, it's it's sort of been one of those really just this sort of change evolution, you know, scenarios that we've seen over time. You know, nobody wanted to just talk about log management. They wanted to talk about analytics. I, I think some people genuinely have developed analytics, but, but you know, the only people that can do that truly are those that are just capable of handling staggering quantities of this data. You know, if you can't build a data lake model that streams into something meaningful, that's not going to help in an analytics discussion. You know, you, you've got to have that capacity to be able to take, you know, billions plus of events and crunch those down into really what I would say, going back to your original point, it's more statistical modeling than anything else today. It's not always machine learning. It's certainly not artificial intelligence. It's typically more stats based analysis of large, large, large data sets. And that's fine. I'll take that over, you know, static stuff all day long. Yep. Yep. And having that, that model to look into and, and really delve into and play with, I think that's, that's the real value. So that's why I love the data lakes is, you know, letting people jump in there and swim, right? You know, it's a playground to play with your data and find those interesting patterns and, and data points. So, you know, the more that we open that up and allow, you know, both automated and, and manual playing in that data, uh, the more valuable it becomes. Yeah, agreed. And that's really where I think a lot of these use cases ultimately need to sort of end up. Some of them are there today and some of them haven't quite made it. Yeah, definitely. All right, we're get, getting close to the end here. So I'm going to try and jump us to the takeaways. Yeah, anyway, I love you number two. I've, I've been talking about that just too much, I think. But, you know, I really want those companies that, that say that they have AI, maybe get independently certified that they have an AI, and then that certification could be uh, some method of control so that AI doesn't become the next Skynet or something. But, yeah, you know, there definitely should be some sort of validation of that AI claim out there. Well, AI Im implies that the machines are, are sentient in some way, right? They are capable of yep. learning on their own without human involvement. I personally haven't seen really almost any of that in the security industry at all. I have seen some legitimate machine learning capabilities where there's just yep. large intelligent evolution of the data analysis over a progressive series of number crunching exercises. Cool. I, you know, I, I, I'd stretch a little bit and call some of that machine learning, especially with the right algorithms and, you know, that human introspection coming in at the appropriate places, but true AI if you really look up what AI means, this is where, you know, I would challenge a vendor in a heartbeat and say, all right, show me how you really got AI. I'll sign an yep. NDA. I'll come on site. I, I want I want to see your, you know, whopper <laughs> crunching the yeah, numbers want, behind the scenes, right? 
Well, I want to see the uh, Shackleford certification service there. So just, you know, go in there and then the, put your stamp of approval on them for AI. I, I would love that. Oh, I'm a professional skeptic. That's never going to work for me. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have to hire that out. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, in, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I think we've hit the things that are most valuable here. You know, don't get caught up in the buzzwords. I don't think the buzzwords are really what makes the case anyway. I think it's the practical capabilities that are being derived from this type of technology evolution. If you're developing machine learning and using statistics behavior uh, analysis to, to sort of get better progressively and provide that as a service to people that are using your, your you know, whatever it is, awesome, right? That's great. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I think that's smart. That's an intelligent way to do it. But if you're just you know, telling me, oh, well, I've got a cloud that's, you know, full of AI, it's AI as a service, and, you know, you're going to just be magically protected because of it, you know, I'm skeptical. Well, you can get to Amazon's AI as a service, right? That's uh, Add that into your tool. <laughs> uh, they have everything as a service. So They have, it, yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I agree completely. And, and you know, it's it's about the value you can get out of your data and having the right data. I think that's the, the key points there that you, you bring up. You know, it, you know, machine learning is fantastic. Statistics are great. Um, but it's about having the right data and, and figuring out how to best get the right uh, usefulness out of that data. Uh, you know, and I think you know, machine learning is a great way for that. I think it's a great new capability to allow us to be able to handle this and find more and more out of those large data sets, the interesting things that we want to see or make determinations. Um, so I, I think it's all good. And, you know, it's really a question of, you know, letting people get out there and, and play with that data and see what they can find. Well, exactly. And, and I think if we're talking about solutions in this space, let's be honest, I think a lot of it comes down to the real research team behind the scenes and saying, well, what are you guys using as your data set to derive this? Yeah. You know, if you guys are on the front lines and you're seeing the attacks and you're, you know, really living this day to day, you're going to have real world data and lots of it to feed into this and, and you know, improve. So that that matters. Yeah. And it, I, I think it matters. Uh, absolutely. And for me, you know, it's my sock that is looking at this and making those human determinations and looking for new types of attacks and, and testing the system and, you know, forcing it to, you know, relearn on things. That's that's where all the value we get is, is, you know, having that intelligent team that's researching, looking, testing and, you know, making, you know, making the system better every single time. So, um, you know, having that group of people to make it, that's that's key and vital. And, and it's not something I think that machines are ever going to take away and unless the AIs really get that good. Um, and I don't think they're going to. Not for a while anyway. Not not. Yeah, not not for a minute. <laughs> We won't hold our breath. Yeah, definitely. I think we're probably coming to the point where we should ask questions, huh? All right. Probably, that good, that great probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, we do have a question. I'll just jump right in with it. Uh, what is the difference between AI and machine learning? That's, that's a good one. Uh, machine learning, is, uh, I think we've covered it fairly well. Um, I mean, David, do you have a good uh, explanation of specifically what AI is, other than well, Skynet? the way, well, yeah, right. But the, the the difference is the lack of human intervention, right? That that's really what it constitutes. And and so I think if you go back to what we talked about with regard to machine learning, machine learning is algorithms that are capable of a feedback loop introducing improvements in the outcomes that are desired. But but at some point, you know, we said it, there has to be a human inflection point to provide context. Artificial intelligence means the machines themselves have that context and they're capable of differentiating completely on their own. They know what a horse is. They don't just look at a picture. They know what a horse is. And that is something that, you know, frankly, I don't think we've got yet. You know, maybe it's hidden away in a lab somewhere that nobody knows, but <laughs> that's different. It probably is. It's probably out in the woods somewhere in somebody's house, right? Um, if you've seen that movie. <laughs> the, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, the other thing is I think those AIs out there have that ability to create new learning paths, right? So, you know, as, you know, we've been talking a lot of how we teach uh, machine learning, you know, how to get better because we have that feedback loop. Well, that feedback loop has to be designed and implemented and, and managed by people. So, 
Um, you know, AIs oftentimes are able to create new learning feedback loops on their own to say, okay, I'm, this is something I don't know and I need to learn it, and they come up with methods to learn it on their own, yeah, much right. like humans do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you're, you, you know, imagine the concept of a curious machine. Yeah, scary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where we're headed into Skynet. Yeah, I think I've seen too many of these movies to be comfortable with it. But, you know, maybe at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, just a, a movie thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, anyone who's read lots of science fiction, uh, you know, William Gibson and the like, you know, you start to get nervous about these concepts. But uh, uh, definitely very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I hope we'll see more of that in the future. Agreed. All right. Well, that's Any all the time we have for there? today. Oh. No. Uh, well, there we're out go. of time. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dave and Jeremiah, for your great presentation, and to ThreadX for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.